ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our fifth special program from the church in Stein, in Appenzeller Land. As you know, we are no longer focusing on particular cantatas, because that we prefer to do live with our ensemble, but we are organizing a series of streamings on different topics of Bach performance. So today, after our summer break, we chose one of Bach's most fascinating pieces written for the violin, the great Chacon. We will be talking about it and about many of the arrangements that other composers have produced of this piece. Ganz herzlich willkommen in der Kirche Stein nach der Sommerpause. Wiederum ein Stream, nicht über eine Kantate, sondern über die berühmte Violinschagon von Johann Sebastian Bach. Ein außerordentliches Stück. Wir werden sie hören, mit Violine gespielt von Amandine Bayer. Und es geht dann auch um Transkriptionen. Und zwar, vielleicht kennen Sie ihn von Rudolf Lutz. Señoras y señores, bienvenidos a nuestro nuevo programa después de las vacaciones de verano desde la iglesia de Stein en la región de Appenzell. Como saben ustedes, no nos estamos concentrando ya en cantatas porque eso lo queremos hacer en directo cuando podamos volver a hacer conciertos con, nuestro, con nuestra orquesta y con nuestro coro, sino que hemos elegido una serie de temas diferentes en torno a la práctica interpretativa de Bach. Y esta noche hemos elegido un tema o una obra que en realidad es una de las obras más fascinantes y más complejas escritas por bajo, escritas en general en la historia de la música, la Gran Chacona para violín solo. Y en, hablaremos mucho de la Chacona, por supuesto, y hablaremos también de los numerosos arreglos y transcripciones que otros compositores han realizado, entre otros el maestro Ruedi Lutz. Bach wrote those important and very great and difficult pieces for violin solo, I imagine, in his last years in Weimar and when he came to Köthen. Uh, he wrote three partitas. A partita is uh, a collection of suites, let's say, Allemand de Courant, Sarabande and Gic, and also three sonata da Chiesa like Gorelli wrote them, and Vivaldi. Slow movement, fast movement, normally a fugue, another slow movement, and perhaps a fast allegro for to end. In the sixth piece in E major, that is the um, suite in, in that beautiful key where he also wrote the violin concerto, pam, pam, he has one very well-known prelude, perhaps if I play it on the keyboard you will recognize it. And so on. A typical piece for the violin. Um, and I would like to just point a, a bit of um, my regards on this piece because it will show us that not only uh, other composers worked on the violin pieces, but Bach himself. Perhaps you know the Ratswahl Cantate 29. And here the organist plays with a big orchestra. Uh, strings, oboes, and even trumpets and timpani. And it was always very interesting. I remember the, the violin players, they sat in the orchestra and then they did rum, rum, rum. They looked fairly bored because they thought it's not really a very nice voice we are playing, we're only playing chords. Rum, rum, rum. And the organists play piri bim pom pom bim bada bada bum. <laughs> and suddenly they realized, oh, they're playing my piece. What I wanted to point out with this is. You can change a piece completely, although the structure and the melody and the rhythm and the form stays uh, the same. Well, since you're talking about arranging things, uh, I thought we might want to show you 
a very special arrangement of that prelude. So I'm thinking of four years ago when we were working with Royston Maldum in Teufen in our festival, and you improvised quite funky pop yes. version of the prelude. And your son, Mr. Lutz Zwei, <laughs> composed a special visual arrangement. So Rudy Lutz made the pop arrangement and Samuel Lutz made the built uh, picture composition. So why don't we show our audience an excerpt of that? That's a good idea. Have That's fun. It. <laughs> Happy birthday. Well, that yeah. was the, yeah, it was a kind of birthday present for Bach that we did, yeah. So, what do you feel when you look at that, when you remember that? Well, actually, I love to hear things like that. Like I told you the last time, as a kiddie type, I am sort of a character enjoying things like that. It was a playback, of course, I couldn't have played all these complicated basses together, but I was the band, the Rudy Lutz band, playing this piece. It's adoring this piece and realizing, isn't it an incredible piece? And you can do it like this, you can do it like that, you could do it with the choir. Uh, I, that's also very interesting that I think Bach himself uh, took his own pieces and, and rewrote them or used them as parodies and, and all these things which make things very interesting. And just to come back 
to the prelude because um, we've got a beautiful example of our um, organist in residence in the Bach Tage four years ago, Johannes Lang, a great, amazing organist. He played the whole cantata 29, he played it on the organ. He, so he took the version of Bach, which he had written for, with this piece, he had written for big orchestra, he put it on the organ himself, had choir, had soloists, and played the, the, the complete cantata himself. And I think Bach would have also been capable of doing it. It's very hard. Johannes Lang, we will hear him and see him now playing the same piece now on his big organ in the church where he is organist in Potsdam near Berlin. And you know, Potsdam is very important for Bach. There he visited the king with his uh, königliches Opfer, das musikalische Opfer. Let's hear it.
an incredible piece, and it sounds completely different here, and isn't uh, uh, Johannes Lang a fine organist? Mm -hmm. I always had a feeling, perhaps, with this way of playing, just as if it would be easy, cooking eggs or, or cutting bread. That was about how I can imagine that Johann Sebastian Bach perhaps came and played and made people quite mad about it. And now we will go into the Chacon, this very famous piece we announced already. And before we have a, a listen to the original with the violin, we will um, look a bit what is a passacaglia, what is an ostinato, what is a Chacon. Um, this is my assistant. She's uh, Anina Bruno, and the other assistant is Matthew Hugentobler, and you must know he built this organ. So he knows everything, and if I would break the organ, he would immediately be capable of helping me to find uh, how to get that in order. But Anina, she's a great pianist, and I would like you to help me. Could you play this bass here? <laughs> You just always from here to here. You do it alone. There yeah, might be something here. Now you keep strong on this bass, perhaps you can play it even with octaves here. You can take a nice forte. And I'll play, I'll try to get you out. Oh, you start. No problem. She plays the bass, I do variations on it. Also the Passacaglia of Bach. <laughs> hasn't got four, but has eight bars. <laughs> That's the Bach one, and now we will just hear a few chords, a few variations from the Buxtehude. And I would like to ask you, Anina, could you get this registration ready for me? And Schwann, perhaps you could do a bit of a, a taking it together with a few uh, phrases, a few sentences in Spanish. Mm, yeah, con, con mucho gusto. Me gustaría resumir lo que han tocado y contado. Se trata naturalmente de formas que usan siempre un bajo ostinato, como la chacona, como la pasacalia. La chacona es una, originalmente una danza que siempre repite en el bajo esos patrones que Anina ha tocado y sobre los cuales Ruedi ha realizado una serie de improvisaciones. Y ahora vamos a hablar un poco de Buxtehude. And listen once again to the beginning, this typical motif, which is really extraordinary to start with. And 
like a, a, a sigh. And then Bach, after he's, he's played the, um, the, the theme once, I'll just transpose it that you hear it in the same key. And then one have, has the feeling it seems to be something a bit the same. I'll play a bit of Bach now in the right key. The similarity of the both pieces, I think it, perhaps it's not just ein Zufall. I think Bach wrote this Pasakalia in honorable thinking back for his great teacher, Buxtehude. That's why he took a similar, um, similar motive at the beginning and saying, you see, mm -hmm. that my, ma my master did that, I do it a bit in another way. A quotation, I would say, which says, Thank you so much, Didi Buxtehude, for the great time I had in Lübeck. Bach, if you think of... So here he uses a bass which comes again. It's a chromatical bass, a pastus durius colus, and the crucifixion of Christ is here in the middle of the center. And not to be forgotten also, Purcell, in his opera Dido and Aeneas, he has the same. And it comes again and comes again and comes again and comes again in the same way like we heard it with Buxtehude, with Bach's Basakala, with Bach's Crucifixus, and now here the tombo of the Dido saying, You, de, you um, weren't true to me, uh, and uh, when I am laid. I'm laid in earth, may my wrongs create no trouble in thy breast. Remember me, but ah, forgive, forget my fate. When I am laid, am laid in earth, may my wrongs create no trouble, no trouble. I rest. Remember me. Remember me, but not my feet, my troubles, and so on. I'm not quite sure if my quotation is correct, but it's something like it. Listen, it. It's also a, a piece which says, "Bye, bye. I'll leave the earth." Could it be what we saw about books de Hude? And Bach, Bach writes for his great master in memoriam a Pasakalia. Bach writes the Crucifixus in memoriam of the death of Jesus. Here Dido sings her song. Perhaps it could be that Bach in his well-known Chacon also wanted to say bye-bye. You know, when he came back from a, 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 a voyage um, with his first, uh, his wife was already buried, and it was a terrible shock for him. That was, I think, in Köthen. We don't know if the Chacon might be a funeral piece 
for Maria Barbara. To end my little introduction into what is a, a, a Pastor Kalia, I would love also to mention Johannes Brahms. Perhaps you know this. Beginning is also a passacaglia, and I always thought the the bass was da 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 da. Then I read a good book. They said, "Listen, it's the passacaglia Johann Sebastian Bach uses in the BVV 150, but it's in the soprano." <laughs> You see, the D, I think it goes like this, something in here, Brahms does D, da. So he just changes around and say, Johann Sebastian Bach, you are the greatest. He also says that, and I'm sure there are hundreds and thousands of composers and musicians who just adore Johann Sebastian Bach, and I imagine like you ladies and gentlemen too. Listen to it. So you see, the shakon or the pasrakalia, it's always difficult to say what's the difference. Everybody says something else, and also the pieces can't clearly show you what is a pasrakalia and what is a shakon. Is an ostinato coming again, coming again, coming again, coming again? Like here in the shakon, listen to the beginning. Here the bass would be ya da 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 da. Sometimes it's like this dee da. Sometimes it's like that dee da 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 dee da. The bass changes the whole time. You can't say it's the same bass, but you've always got those four bars. It's like life, birth. A variation starts, the development, and then the end, the cadence. We've got thirty-three variations in. Minor. We've got 19 variations in major, and then we've got another 12 variations in uh, minor again. This is a Schulwandtafel. I can stick it here. I'm sure you saw my Ola. Uh, here we are. Now, please, the cameras, could you? Could you put my beautiful little? So you see, the form is, is, is not symmetrical. I would say the first part in minor is about the same length as, as the, the one in major and minor. And that's the interesting thing you hear. Uh, now, Schwann, I've been talking terribly much English. And I think you, in your great capacity of, of just bringing everything in a few sentences, could you do that in... Spanish, for our Spanish-speaking public. Mm. Sí, con mucho gusto. Un resumen del, <ríe> de la gran explicación que acaba de darnos Ruedi. Él ha hablado naturalmente de Buxtehude, de Bach, del Crucifixo de Bach y finalmente de Brahms. Estos cuatro compositores tienen en común, o las obras que él acaba de tocar, estas formas con bajos ostinados. En concreto, la pasacalia de Buxtehude, la pasacalia de Bach, que seguramente es un homenaje a Buxtehude, el crucifixus de Bach con esos uh, bajos cromáticos descendentes y eh, el final, el cuarto movimiento de la, el, de la cuarta sinfonía de Brahms, con, ese, con esa cita, con esa referencia a la cantata BW 150, me parece, en el soprano. Esas son las formas de, de, de pasacalia de las que ha hablado Rudy Lutz. Incluso una más que me acabo de olvidar, perdón, de Dido y Eneas de Purcell. When I am laid in earth. 
Y lo último que nos acaba de explicar Ruedi es la estructura de la chacona. Como ha demostrado en, en, en su uh, gráfico, tenemos una primera parte con, uh, me parece que son um, 33 compases, ya, 33 takte am Anfang, 33 compases en, en modo menor, después 19 en modo mayor y después 12 en modo menor. He dicho compases, se trata de grupos de cuatro compases, repetidos 33 veces, 19 veces y 12 veces. The main topic this evening is the adaption of the Chacon. As you can see what I've been doing with the Chacon, I think it's very important that you've got the possibility to hear the Chacon uh, from a, a fine uh, violin player who plays it on a, on a historical instrument. It's Amandine Beyer. She uh, will uh, play you the Chacon now. We had it as a reflection in the Cantata 9. Uh, is does Highlands common here? Perhaps you could yeah. say a few words about the yeah. reflection. Yeah, reflection lectures. You know, um, for most of you who follow us, you know that during our concerts there is always an introductory workshop. You know about that. And we perform always one cantata twice. In between, there is a so-called reflection lecture on the cantata text. So it's a kind of speech given by very different personalities of the arts, of literature, of the world of economics, professors, all sorts of people that talk about the cantata text from their own subjective viewpoint. And so for once in this cantata, number nine, a few years ago, we had a musical reflection lecture. Amandine Beyer performed the wonderful Chacon on a uh, historic violin for us. And so that's what we want to watch and hear now. Yeah. Liebes Bach Publikum, keine gesprochene Reflexion, sondern eine musikalische. Dies bereits zum dritten Mal hörten wir für eine Weihnachtskantate in Oldi Alder, der in seiner Komposition meditierte über nun kommt der Heiden Heiland, war es die Komposition von Roland Moser, der in der Kantate nur jedem das Seine, seine persönlichen Worte in Musik fasste. Heute ist es nun Bach, Kamenz Bach, mit der berühmten Schakon für Violine Solo, ein Stück, das für mich das Universum aller menschlichen Gefühle in diesen 64 Wiederholungen der immer gleichen und ähnlichen Kadenz, wie ein Meer, das immer an den Strand brandet, darstellt. Ein herzliches Willkommen unserem Special Guest und unserer Reflexionistin Amandine Beyer.
a perfect piece. Why any arrangements, transcriptions, <laughs> or adaptions? What do you think, Schwann? Well, I think that, first of all, this piece is a demonstration that the impossible is possible. Namely, uh, a melodic instrument is able to play uh, polyphony in an incredible way. Uh, that's what Bach created, and what Amandine uh, is able to convey is with this um, amazingly transparent way of playing is exactly that. So um, uh, it's amazing. But you didn't answer my question. <laughs> it's too difficult. Your question is too difficult. You are going to show afterwards uh, whether or not transcriptions are needed. I mean, we may not forget that a lot of people just say, just leave your fingers away from that thing. It's, it's, it's heaven. It doesn't need any note, any to it. And of course, like you said, uh, Schwann, he wants to show how I can make a huge orchestra with just one instrument, with those little uh, four strings. And uh, I would like to read you something what Brahms said, because he did a transcription, Johannes Brahms, our beloved Johannes Brahms. The Schakon is mir eines der wunderbarsten, unbegreiflichsten Musikstücke. Auf ein System für ein kleines Instrument, you must afterwards translate it to Spanish, please. Oh. <laughs> ja. Auf ein System für ein kleines Instrument schreibt der Mann eine ganze Welt von tiefsten Gedanken und gewaltigsten Empfindungen. Mm. Hätte ich, Johannes Brahms, das Stück machen, empfangen können, ich weiß sicher, die übergroße Aufregung und Erschütterung hätten mich verrückt gemacht. This was um, 1879, he wrote this to Clara Schumann. And I think he's not the one, only one who just is completely mad about this incredible piece. Now, Mr. Schwamm, mm. Castaneda, please. Yeah. <laughs> Brahms, que era un gran admirador de Bach, le escribió en 1879 a Clara Schumann eh, en una carta que la Chacona efectivamente era para él una de, de las obras musicales más no solo más maravillosas, sino más, más difíciles de, de comprender, de comprender. Eh, Bach compone en esta pieza un universo entero con los pensamientos más profundos y los sentimientos más violentos en un sentido. Uh, esto es lo que le escribió Johannes Brahms a Clara Schumann. What I like about this, it shows a bit something what Brahms thinks of music making. He just said, hätte ich das Stück machen, if I would have done the piece, uh, oder empfangen können, I would have received the piece. Mm -hmm. So it might be that Brahms waited till he had this idea to say, this is the way I will do it. And perhaps when he did his... suddenly had this brainwave of taking the Bach, Passacaglia theme, and putting it in the soprano and finding such an incredible harmony. Yes, I think it is um, this sort of feeling of gratitude that pieces like that exist, that one tries to rewrite them. I would say, in my case, it's this. I realized I wanted to get to know this piece better, and so I said, I must write it. And then I remember I had a youngster in one of our classes, and um, um, he told me I would like to, um, to ask you to talk about uh, the Chacon. And I said, yes, that's a lovely piece from Bach, and I, I think I played by heart. And I didn't know anymore, so I realized I don't know the piece really. So I said, I will dig in. And I started to play it. I started to think out harmonies. I started to think out how could I give other voices to it. Because this is like a, a sort of a, a, a file, a fil rouge going through the whole thing. And then I was composing it. I remember very well um, uh, how I worked. And then I got into it. And I try to find the effects. I would like to go through a few of them. Um, um, listen to the beginning. It's a sarabande. 
One, two, one, two. It repeats it again. And then it goes, it goes up to the high B flat. You've got the rhythm ram patim taram tararim tarim baba taram tararam tidim darari. The same with other accompaniments. The chromatical bass, like with the crucifixus. Once again, I've of course could also play to Melancholic line. Neapolitan diminished chord confusion. Ram pim pam ralla, or perhaps like Amandine played. There are no fault and no piano. There's very little articulation in the piece. We have to find out the story we listen to. That's anyway my idea. Now, if you imagine Bach wrote this and said, death is here, it's a fate. It comes three times in the whole piece. I mean, if I played like this. Then you don't hear a story. It can be ha ta wan wa ti ri ta ri la di da 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 di 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 da di. We could also write it for string orchestra or for a big orchestra, and then you know, go off. I can play it on a huge organ. I can play it on a smaller organ. It, I can play it on a harpsichord. The incredible thing is, it's always the same piece, and it's always somehow different. If you listen to another few variations, my left hand is now accompanying myself. Schumann, by the way, and Mendelssohn, they both wrote uh, piano accompaniments for the piece. You can play it with violin and with, uh, uh, with piano. Of course, it's somehow difficult because the, the, the violin does a lot of bass notes. It can do... You can sort of go through the harmonies, give an idea of an upper line, and you can go through the harmonies and give the bass and, of course, also the chords with it. Then you heard this here. This, this incredible rush. And then this um, part where I think it's like an arguing. Misanthropic. Desperate. And then he comes and says, Arpeggio. The arpeggio is on the violin. You just can do... You keep the chord in your hands, and that's how it goes off. And that was, of course, very interesting in the piano version. Shall I do...
and so on. Now, what happened actually, I was working at this piece, I was writing a few variations, I was trying to find the harmonies, and one of my uh, um, thorough bass students, Edna Stone, a fine pianist, came in and said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, shut up, I'm just working. And she said, I want to know what you're doing here. And I said, okay, I'll show you, I'm writing the shotgun. And she said, play it for me. I felt quite uneasy because she was a great pianist uh, all day that, those days. Uh, and then I played it for her and then she said, I like the piece. Uh, could you go on writing it for me? I will play it. That was, of course, a nice uh, idea. And Edna Stern then, after I think it was one and a half years, I had finished the piece. She uh, recorded it and we will now listen to a part which I wrote for her with arpeggios. So you can see what are the possibilities for a rewriting composer saying, John Sebastian, I love your piece, I also want to play it. Swan, you are a pianist, mm. and you, I think you, you know Busoni, the mm. adaption of Busoni. You think you played mm. the one for Brahms. Mm. By the way, the, only with the left hand, a great idea to say, playing the Bach with one hand is two hands, no problem, but playing the Bach with the left hand, it's a real tricky piece, and I think it's a very interesting way of doing it. And of course, you heard I did it in a completely different way, but I would like to ask you, Schwann, um, you were also reading in the score. Uh, what is your impression about the adaption of Rudi Lutz? Well, you I... Say now, uh, very nice things you have to say now. <laughs> no, say what you think, please. <laughs> I, can, I feel you wrote it from the keyboard and for the keyboard because it's a very pianistic transcription. It's very difficult, but I think it, you know, it's leaked, leaked in the hand. 
in a way. And uh, I hear a lot of Brahms in it. And you mentioned Busoni. Busoni is very orchestral, and it's, the organ comes out is very massive. And I think you're here more interested to exploit the uh, sonorities of the keyboard, uh, even in an impressionistic way. We just heard the major part with these bells, with this glocken, mm -hmm. um, and uh, with these wonderful pedal effects as well. So I think it's a very pianistic, even Listian uh, kind of piece you wrote in a certain way. Um, I remember I played, I was working for two years at the piece, and I was really digging into the piece of Bach. And you will perhaps not believe me, but every single note of the composition of Johann Sebastian Bach is in my score. I didn't kick out any, I just changed a few things in the, in the cadence where I wanted to have more energy, but actually you can find the whole Bach in it. And uh, yeah. The, you see, I'm also trying to tell a story when I play the piece. And I'm quite sure, as a musician, you always have to try to tell a story. It mustn't be a, a, a novel or something like that, but you've got your pictures. Also, when you play a French récit, perhaps, récit de Nazar, not only look how the trills go, but really think you're in the, on the opera, and you've got a person singing a desperate love song. Perhaps I go back again to the piece and point out a few little versions, little uh, details, and then afterwards, to end the evening, I would like to play my improvised version for the organ in Stein. Organ builder Matthias Hugentopler will be on the right side, and Anina Brunner will be on the left side, on <laughs> the yellows and the, uh, the red ones. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, we, we heard Schwann talking of the, the soft part, after you've heard the theme again, and then it goes down. I think it's resignative. And here, dreamy, those were the days. Soft. It builds up. As if Bach would say, it's my imagination, it's very romantic, don't, don't take it for, for granted that he thought it, but perhaps I anyway do. Do you remember Maria Barba? Do you remember the... Do you remember the spring flowers? Butterflies. comes from the lowest part of the violin. You see how high he gets up here. And then a very important part for me is this. La ta ta. La ta ta. It rings a bell. La ta ta. La ta ta. La 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 And these 
this part here, da 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 ri ti ta ta da da ti ti, is for me expectation, expectation. Will I see her in heaven again? And then, yes, they see each other. Ri da la ri ri la da ri ri da ri da ri 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 It is a swing low, sweet chariot. The energy of a carol, of a, of a, of a spiritual. And then it comes into those arpeggios again. It ends, and then comes this chord. Which says, no, nothing, no idea, she's dead. I mean, it's my interpretation, I can't say so, but there were a lot of Pasacalias and Chacons which were used as a tombeau, like uh, called in French. And then you remember when this haunting motif came. <laughs> Yeah, I'm improvising the piece. I, it's not a written piece. I'm just doing my version. Like when a, when a jazz musician say, I'm going to now play my great... Uh, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. It's always a bit the same, but always a bit different. And I think this was the way a lot of musicians played their piece. They could play it. They could play it by heart. They played it once again. They played it once again, once again, and once. It always changed a little. And perhaps they wrote it down and said, I want to have a, one fine written solution. I think it's time, Schwann, to get to the uh, last performance. And I would um, ask uh, then Anina and Matthias to get ready. But I have a question. Yes. I still have a question. Please. So you've talked a lot about different aspects of the Chacon, musicological aspects and otherwise, but there is something you didn't mention, and many people talk about, namely whether there is a hidden or various hidden quotations of chorales in this piece. Are there chorales in there? Well, I've heard this edition, and if you, ladies and gentlemen, put it in, you will find it, uh, chorale, Christlach in Todesbanden and things like that. They fit it in, it sounds quite interesting, but for my uh, consent, uh, it's not a quotation of a chorale, because me as a, a scout of chorales, I'm chorale fartfinder, because I hear them immediately if they are in something. Um, then I didn't ever find it. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think this is a really expressive piece and it shows an incredible variational uh, capacities of Johann Sebastian Bach. If you think of the Goldberg Variation, and you've got the same. There is 32 bars and here is always four bars, always with another um, changing story, uh, storyteller. Right. So I think we're getting to... Uh the icing on the cake. I mean, the cake is already very big and very <laughs> rich, but the, the, uh, the cherry on the cake, uh, you are going to perform your own improvis improvised version uh, at the organ, on the organ. And tonight, Johannes Lang, whom you heard at the beginning of our uh, program, he will be performing at the Berliner Dom, at the uh, Berlin Cathedral, the organ version of Ready, which is written down, but Ready now is going to improvise on the piece right here and right now. So I think we can ask our friends to prepare the organ for your improvisation, if you would agree. And as a music 
I've got this violin voice, uh, like I explained with all the notations of the stops, mm. which uh, Anina and Matthew will get on the spot to change the sound. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I may say just a last word while the organ is prepared. I would like to quote Vusoni again, who uh, was one of the transcribers, as we mentioned earlier on. And he wrote, I think to his editor, if I remember correctly, that thanks to Bach, because Bach was a transcriber of his works himself, uh, he understood that great pieces of music, regardless of the instrument they are played on and the form they are transcribed, remain great. And I believe the Chacon is the epitome of that uh, truth that Busoni saw as a musical truth. That's my last comment to this uh, program. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm so much looking forward now myself to Rudy's improvisation on the Chacon. We three will do our best, and you see new masks from the Bach Stiftung. Thank you so much for this consideration. Good luck. <laughs> And I'm sure you saw I've got the right shoes on. So, viel Glück.